We'll move on to the next speaker and uh, perhaps we'll have questions for you during the panel discussion. Uh, so our next speaker is going to talk about the role of ribavirin. Now about a year ago we thought we were witnessing a requiem for ribavirin and then the resurrection began to occur at ASLD 2014 and has continued. Uh, very few people in the world have uh, studied or given as much thought to this question of what the role of ribavirin is or how it's working than our speaker, Professor Graham Foster, who's professor of hepatology at Queen Mary University of London. He's also a PhD in molecular biology and has run an active research lab uh, for many years. He's past president of the British Association for the Study of Liver Disease, and finally the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Viral Hepatitis. Graham, you've been a speaker with us every year so far, as have the two previous speakers. Welcome back. Ari, it's a real pleasure. I'm very grateful for the invitation. Um, about an hour ago, I was beginning to wonder whether I was going to get here on time, but once again, the Germans came to the rescue of Europe, so God bless Lufthansa. I've got a tricky question to ask, which is ribavirin. What are we going to do with it? Do we need it? Do we include it? Who needs it? So let's begin by giving you a little bit of work to do, and here's my question. I'm going to make it tricky because I'm going to give you a minute to think about this, then I'm going to come back at the end, and I'm going to ask for whose opinion has changed. So, patients with genotype 1 and compensated liver cirrhosis, you're only funded for 12 weeks, which I'm afraid, Nid, despite your uh, aspirations for longer treatment, is the best we can do in Europe. Only selected patients get RIBA. Depends on the subgenotype. Always add RIBA regardless. Just measure viral load at two weeks, a response-guided therapy approach. Interesting to see how this hasn't quite died yet. And give everyone 800 milligrams. So have a think what you choose. We'll go through the presentation, and then we'll come back to the question. So the first question, of course, is why are we bothering about this? Why not just chuck ribavirin in? It's cheap. It's dirt cheap. There's no long-term toxicity. There's no long-term downside to ribavirin. Why not just roll it out? Well, when you ask that question to your patient, the answer is always go forth and multiply. Patients hate this. It's a really unpleasant drug. It makes you feel a little bit tired. Your hemoglobin goes down. A number of patients are getting what we call riba rage. They get quite psychiatrically anxious on the drug, and a few of them get unfortunate skin rashes. So the problem with ribavirin is patients don't like it. It's got a bad name amongst patients. And very often, you have to persuade patients of its value if you want to include it in a regime. So we really do want to be selective about this and just use it in the patients where it's actually going to be beneficial. So this is very much a practical guide, a slightly personal view of who needs and who doesn't need RIBA. First question, of course, is how does it act? When is it critical? And then the unknowns. So how does it work? Well, we know how it works because Jean-Michel Paolozzi, no less, has told us it's a fairly weak direct-acting antiviral. This is his gastroenterology paper published a little while ago looking at ribavirin monotherapy, just ribavirin, and you can see in many of these patients the viral load drifts down by about half a log. Notice that some patients, and we'll come back to this, some patients don't respond to ribavirin. We've heard a lot of talk about RIBA's immunomodulatory effects, all sorts of other hypotheses as to how it works, none of which have really stood the test of time. But what does seem to be consistent is it's a little bit of a weak antiviral. Here's an interesting study, a slightly neglected study from Steve Feinstein's group, growing a virus in different concentrations of ribavirin and eventually developing a ribavirin-resistant virus. You can see in the middle panel, when you're using a modest dose of ribavirin, the virus that's been grown in riba becomes refractory. But you can overcome that by pushing the dose of ribavirin up. And that really fits with our clinical experience. We've always known that if you really push the ribavirin dose, you could take non-responders and convert them into responders. And it fits with Jean-Michel's data. There's a little subset of patients who don't respond terribly well. I don't think resistance is the term, because a 300 to 400 millimolar shift is trivial, but refractory is perhaps the word I'd use. And this is data from my own group. This is growing hep C in a capture fusion model, looking at cirrhotic patients in the English Early Access program, looking at the ribavirin sensitivity of those who were cured, achieved an SVR, and those who didn't. 
And again, you can see those who didn't have a slight shift in ribavirin sensitivity. This, of course, is a decompensated, cirrhotic, hard-to-manage population where perhaps ribavirin plays a much bigger role than it does in other cohorts. So I think this is a weak antiviral agent. I think it supplements the other more potent antivirals, but it's weak. And viruses with reduced sensitivity are common and might be induced by treatment. And I'll come back to that point towards the end. So when do we need it? Well, actually, here we've got a lot of data. I'm starting here with the Sophosphivir Lodiposvir studies. Just run your eye across those, and you can see right across the board, with without ribavirin, doesn't make a blind bit of difference. So for most patients with two very powerful DAAs, you don't need ribavirin. Frankly, you've crushed this virus. Adding in another weak agent is redundant. Similar sort of story with the ABV regime. We've always known that protease inhibitors are a little more potent against genotype 1B. So your 1B patients simply don't need RIBA. You cure all of them, 99%, without the addition of RIBA. For genotype 1A, where the protease is just a little weaker, you can see just a little hint that RIBA adds a little bit. Whether that's statistically significant, statistically relevant, clinically meaningful, I think is a different question. But in my own practice, we add ribavirin to the genotype 1As, and most of the guidelines go that way, because I think it's a good thing to push for that extra SVR point. But I suspect most patients don't need it. So in straightforward, easy to cure patients, your big, powerful drugs will crush the virus. You don't need anything extra. You don't need riba. What about the toughies? What about the cirrhotics? What about the co-infecteds? Well, here we have a little bit of data. And this, again, is an analysis looking at Sophosphivir lodiposvir. It's a French analysis, and it's a meta-analysis. So it's not a randomized trial. It's not a proper head-to-head -head comparison in any shape or form. It's just pooling the data from different studies and producing what I think is a very important analysis of different durations with without RIBA. And the efficacy summary, as you can see here, highlighted is that for those patients with cirrhosis where you're giving a shortish 12-week course of treatment, ribavirin buys you an extra 5 6%. You can overcome the need for ribavirin by extending the duration going out to 24 weeks, but I think that for most of us with cost on our minds, going for 12 weeks plus riba in cirrhotic patients is probably the right thing to do. Similar story with the ABV regime. All of the turquoise studies included ribavirin, which I think was the right thing to do. You really don't want to lose a patient with cirrhosis and generate problems downstream, so go for broke first time and add ribavirin to the cirrhotics, and you'll get these spectacular response rates in a properly controlled head-to-head ribavirin-containing trial. So I think a simple message for cirrhotics, do they need ribavirin? Yes, they do. It probably gives you another 4 or 5% SVR, and I, for one, think that is very much worth fighting for. Different story with the co-infecteds. Co-infected patients, we now know, are an easy-to-manage patient group with the new DAAs. I'm just showing you data from Sophosphivir lodiposvir, exactly the same data with the ABV combinations. If you have HIV, you don't need ribavirin unless you have another need, for example, cirrhosis. So for difficult-to-cure patients with cirrhosis, I would add RIBA, otherwise take it away. I think that will come through in the next generation drugs. I think the pattern that's emerging is if you've got really powerful DAAs and your SVR rates are comfortably over 90%, ribavirin adds nothing. But if your regime is a little weak, if there's a little bit of exposure somewhere, ribavirin's helpful and just carries you over that 95% line that we all aspire to. What about the other genotypes? Well, genotype 3, it's the same story, actually. If you look at the genotype 3 data, what emerges very clearly is the non-serotics roll over and die very quickly. It's the serotics that cause trouble. Here's the ally trial data. If you take patients with an appropriate regime, and I have to say I don't think Sophosphivir ribavirin is an appropriate regime for genotype 3. I think you need a second DAA. This is the ALI study we've been using to in Europe for some time. And you can see without ribavirin, 
12 weeks of sulfosfavir to clatosfir will take most of your patients well over that 90% barrier. They'll be cured without riba. But once they have cirrhosis, you define it how you like, whether you do a blood test or a scan or a biopsy, the SVR rate plummets. And I think most of us in our practice have found much better response rates in genotype 3 cirrhotics with riba and sulfosfavir to clatosfir. We don't yet have enough data to be sure of that, but I certainly add ribavirin into all my cirrhotics with a soft DAC regime. Similar story with sofladiposphere. Sofladip plus ribavirin, surprisingly effective. Ladiposphere is relatively weak in the lab, but it does seem to be particularly good in patients. You can see again, if you take the ribavirin out of your genotype three patients, they wobble. And just look at the bottom of the chart for the cirrhotics. One out of four cirrhotics without ribavirin responded. Six out of six cirrhotics with ribavirin responded. So again, it's the same story. If the patient doesn't have cirrhosis, you probably don't need it. If they've got a touch of difficulty, a little bit of significant fibrosis, ribavirin brings them home. Nid muttered about genotype 2 and the lack of a second agent. So when we don't have a second agent, that's where ribavirin really does become necessary. I think ribavirin will drift very quickly with the soft DAC story and potentially the soft LADIP story. We know there are trials of soft LADIPASVIR in Japan in genotype 2. We look forward to seeing that data. But my guess is that soft LADIP, soft DAC will do without ribavirin. So you do at the moment need sofosfavir with ribavirin for genotype 2. That's just because we haven't quite caught up with the next generation drugs. For genotype 4, I'm not going to make a pronouncement because I think the data is a little bit weak. We don't really have enough data with without ribavirin to be confident. The data that's emerging suggests that it's going to be a genotype 1 phenomenon. So if they don't have cirrhosis, you probably can use sofladiposvir or the ABV regime without ribavirin. If they do have cirrhosis, I think you're probably going to find you do need to add it, and that will give you that boost to the sustained response rates. So we don't yet have enough data to be dogmatic, but I think that's the direction of travel. I started by saying that there may be a refractory state. There may be patients least responsive to ribavirin, and perhaps you could induce that by exposing patients. So let me just roll the question at you. Suppose you've had someone ribavirin exposed. Are they going to be refractory? to ribavirin second time round. There's just a hint that might be the case. This is the data with soft ribavirin, spectacular data as you can see. Look at the naive patients, cirrhotics, non-cirrhotics, all being blown away. But just turn your attention to the toughies, the cirrhotics. If your cirrhotic patient has had peg riba before, they do much less well when you give them soft riba second time round. Not sure why that is. You're entitled to argue it's nothing to do with the drugs. It's all about compliance. It's all about advanced fibrosis. But actually, the cirrhotics who haven't been treated are doing pretty well. So I just wonder if what we're seeing here is a little bit of riba resistance creeping in, just nullifying the benefits of this drug. And that has practical implications. We're just starting to see, and I think Nid's hinted, the Americans who've been throwing these drugs around like there was no tomorrow, they're starting to see patients fail. So if you've got a patient who's failed soft ladiposphere, soft aclatosphere, putting ribavirin in seems a sensible thing to do second time round. But I'd like to wager, and I'd be interested to hear comments, if they're peg riba failures, adding ribavirin might have less benefit than you think, and you might be better going for a much extended duration or swapping regimes altogether. So let me be provocative, and I'm sure Stefan will bring us back to this in the panel after the talk. So the answer to the question, who needs ribavirin, is, I think, fairly simple. If you've got easy-to-cure patients, you don't need ribavirin. Just give them the drugs, get rid of the virus, and move on quickly. But in your tough patients, in your patients where the second drug isn't perhaps quite as good, such as the genotype 2 story. If you've got patients with cirrhosis, I think ribavirin adds something to the party. So we'll go back to the question. And I'd like a little bit of honesty from the floor, if I may, please. Whose opinion has changed, or who's doing exactly what they were doing anyway? 
whose opinion has changed. That's what I like. I have a convert. I have one convert. And on that, I'll thank you very much, and we'll move on. Thanks very much. One person. One person. Thank you, Graeme. I think we'll have a couple of questions to, to come back. Um, quite provocative. And uh, Nid, if you read very carefully ESL and ASLD guidelines in cirrhotic patients, the Europeans do recommend ribavirin in treatment naive cirrhotics, while this is not recommended by ASLD. And you both may think about what you're going to answer to that later on.